I started to kind of think about this about 2016, um, early 2017. And at the time, the CEO of Google said, the last 10 years have been about building a world that is mobile first. In the next 10 years, we will shift to a world that is AI first. And I think one of the neatest analogies I've heard is that AI is really the fourth industrial revolution. So we had steam power to mechanize production in the, 18, in the 1780s, electricity to drive mass production in the 1870s, electronics and software to automate production from the 1970s, and then software is a primary source of value creation for the processing of information. And I think um, certainly for those of us um, who have been around since the 1970s, and I'll come back to this, I think that's um, you know, an accurate depiction. Um, I practice in Chicago. I practice in a multiple hospital system, depending on how you count the hospitals and who's bought who in the past week, about 16 hospitals, um, 40 plus pathologists. We process tissue in three separate facilities uh, in Illinois and Indiana, um, and the workload gets distributed, uh, sent in from the hospitals and then sent back out to the referring hospitals. And uh, the dots change and the number of dots change and the number of pathologists change and so forth. But the point is, I think this is a very common scenario for the practice of pathology in the United States today consolidation of hospitals, cons now, we, now we're seeing consolidation of healthcare systems, uh, either multiple separate pathology groups, some consolidation of pathology groups, decentralized um, professional services, but centralized technical services. So we see more core labs and more centralized histology processing. Um, and every time you know, I think about a new technology or an advance in medicine, I try to think about how does it affect uh, me, how does it affect the rank and file community surgical pathologist? What does this mean for my life? So hopefully uh, this talk will give some insight into that. Um, obviously the implications and the advantages and the disadvantages for one of the 45 National Cancer Institute cancer centers may be different, but for those of us in the community, what does all this mean? How will this make my life better? How would it allow me to do what I do better, faster, cheaper, more accurately? Uh, or read fewer slides, or read more slides more efficiently, et cetera. So this kind of started about a year and a half ago. I, I wrote a piece on the blog about AI versus MD, and it, it sort of got picked up, and I've been asked to speak about this, and it might have been kind of lost in the story a little bit, but the original post was based on an article in The New Yorker um, written by the um, oncologist who wrote The Emperor of All Maladies, which became a Ken Burns documentary on PBS. If you haven't read the book or seen the documentary, I encourage you to do so. Um, and unfortunately, in the piece, um, the article pointed out, specifically with regard to, to cancers and melanoma, actually, uh, he, the oncologist says, if a dermatologist can do it, then a machine should be able to do it as well. Um, and I took, I took, um, I, I, I took that kind of personally, that um, a dermatologist diagnosed melanoma, and I talked about that, and apparently pathologists don't diagnose melanomas. So, um, but if, you know, apparently if the dermatologist can do it, then a machine can do it, and presumably if a pathologist were to diagnose cancer, then a machine could replace him or her. So I started to kind of look into this and see where all this was had been and where things are going. So these are some predictions by um, artificial intelligence researchers um, in terms of when will AI outperform humans at work. Um, and there are error bars there, probability bars, uncertainty ranges, but within a few years fold laundry, a um, few more years drive a truck. Now autonomous vehicles, I think uh, we put the brakes on that, no pun intended, um, retail salespeople, um, robot presumably can write a New York Times bestseller and so forth. Um, unfortunately, we probably won't see replacement of surgeons in my lifetime um, with surgical, <laughs> full surgical robots. So we still have to, as a surgical pathologist, have to deal with uh, surgical oncologists and surgeons and uh, put up with their yelling and so forth. So um, probably not in the time that I'm practicing. Um, Fortunately, if you are an artificial intelligence researcher, and there might be a few in here, uh, you probably won't get replaced either in your lifetime. So um, that's good for you. Um, if you're the president of Russia, you have a little bit different take. 
artificial intelligence is the future, not only for Russia, but for all humankind. Um, and whoever becomes the leader in this sphere will become the ruler of the world. So, uh, and then, you know, every time there's a new technology, and I guess perhaps I'm, I'm less naive than I was maybe 20, 25 years ago when people said, well, this is gonna replace this, and this is gonna make things more specific, and this is gonna make things better, faster, cheaper, more accurate, and then I'd always buy into it. Now, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm a little bit more skeptical. So if you look at the typical Gartner curve, you know, you have the peak of inflated expectations. Once there's that technology trigger, you have the trough of disillusionment, slope of enlightenment, and then where we get to the plateau of productivity. So um, we talked a little bit about liquid biopsy this morning. I think the jury's still out on that. There may be some very specific use cases. We've seen some advances with liquid-based cytology. Maybe not even so much liquid-based cytology, but actually the fact that putting the cells in a fluid that we can do HPV testing on is actually more important than looking at the cells and the morphology and automated, automated screening of cytology, smears, and so forth. So there's other deliverables. And then, then they change the guidelines and they say you don't need a pap smear every year, and then there's fewer pap smears, and then there's other issues. So um, immunohistochemistry, chemistry, the best thing I ever heard about immunohistochemistry chemistry is uh, make sure you use the antibody within the first six months of the publication because that's when it's most specific. <laughs> so as you use immunohistochemistry, the, the antibodies become less and less specific. Um, immunotherapy is very exciting. Um, I've been to ASCO the past several years, and you can see the, um, the excitement is very palpable among oncologists in terms of immunotherapy. And there's tens of hundreds of posters on, on PDL1 and other immunotherapies and Keytruda and Optivo, and it's very well marketed, and there's a lot of general excitement. Now it actually turns out PDL1 status may not even matter. It may not even matter that we can count PDL1 or quantify it, that pa patients will benefit from one of the anti PDL drugs regardless. So I wrote a post not too long ago suggesting putting Keytruda in the drinking water, uh, much like we do fluoride. So, um, Nobody picked that up, but we'll see. <laughs> so if you look at the actual uh, Gartner hype cycle going back to 2015, uh, you can see autonomous vehicles was at the peak there. It's interesting. I didn't realize that things can kind of shift a little bit on these curves from year to year, but I sort of assume, assume that. Um, but machine learning uh, was, was headed down towards that, uh, that trough of disillusionment before it came back up. Other things that... Um, you know, are kind of their enterprise 3D printing. Uh, we're gonna hear about augmented and virtual reality in a little bit, so we'll see if, if that's where they are on the curve with that. Um, hybrid cloud computing, you know, maybe we've kind of hit, hit, hit the, the plateau on that already. So if you look at 2017, uh, we're still kind of maybe at that peak, at the peak in, uh, in terms of deep learning and machine learning. Um, again, <laughs> AR and VR, are, are down in the trough and, and headed towards that plateau. So it's still very exciting. We're not all disillusioned yet. That's um, exponentially the, the wrong way. So what is AI? AI was a term actually coined by an assistant professor at Dartmouth in 1956 by the name of John McCarthy, and it was a general term that referred to hardware or software that exhibits behavior which appears to be intelligent. Uh, essentially the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. And there was limited progress for a very long time because we didn't have the GPUs, we didn't have the processing power to solve real world problems with the computers that, that people were building. Um, fortunately now that, that has changed um, as is being reflected in the market. So just a few couple definitions here. Um, deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Um, the, it avoids the programmer for, from having to undertake the task of feature specification, and the algorithm also avoids optimization requirements. And I think as opposed to you know, information kiosks or self-service work computers or those sorts of things, these, these models are designed to model the brain, um, not the world. So to respond to other information that it's not programmed to normally handle. And the way that this is done is with neural networks with millions of examples with increasing accuracy at each point. And without belaboring the issue, what happens is one neuron gets an input, that becomes its output, which becomes the input for another neuron, and so forth and so on. So, 
you know, it's actually, obviously, it's been, it's been defined for a long time. It's been defined for over 60 years. Um, people have been working on this for quite some time. Perhaps we didn't have the computing power. But why is AI such a big deal now? So um, certainly improved algorithms, convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets, as I mentioned, improved hardware and computer processing power with GPUs. Um, we have extensive data. We have extensive amount of shared data with cloud computing. Um, and so now we have a lot of interest, investment, and entrepreneurship. I was thinking sitting in the back in the course of this uh, session this morning, you know, Neil's lab has probably scanned about 10,000 slides in the time that we've been sitting here. So the amount of data creation um, has been very, very significant. I guess the other thing on that note, you know, in terms of digital pathology and whole slide imaging, um, and what I followed over the past 12 years or so, and longer in terms of actually implementing digital pathology technologies. Um, and Yul Belize talked about this 20 years ago, by creating a whole slide image, you have this extensive digital data set that can be mined. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of data there. And I think in the time that it's taken us to figure out the regulatory issues and is it suitable for primary diagnosis and are there consultation models that make practical business sense and so forth, you know, we figured out that it's, it's it maybe the, the advantage in, is in mining the information on the whole slide rather than using the whole slide as a substrate for primary diagnosis or international telepathology or domestic telepathology and the like. So that's happened. So we have extensive data. Humanity produces 2,300 million gigabytes every day. Um, the, uh, the odd figure here is 90% of the world's data has been created in the past few years. So I don't know what y'all have been doing for the past uh, three or four decades, but uh, we produce a lot more of the data now. Uh, by 2020, we'll be transferring 61,000 gigabytes per second. Um, however, I'm reminded by this uh, famous quote, never under underestimate the bandwidth of a station wagon full of tapes hurtling down the highway. And Andrew Tannenbaum was a um, computer scientist. He now runs actually electoralvote.com, a website that try to, tries to predict elections. He's not been very successful, but it's fun to watch. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, a tremendous amount of interest, investment, entrepreneurship in AI, in AI right now. These are companies that I know of publicly announced, um, uh, public announcements in terms of investments, series investments, et cetera. Um, I think about $70 million since last November. Um, Laron made this slide, Laron Pantinowitz made this slide for one of his talks, so I'm borrowing that. Um, so about 70 million there for pathology AI uh, since last November. Um, before I got on the plane to come here, there's another company, there's another AI uh, pathology company with uh, some folks uh, from UPMC, uh, certainly a long history of pathology informatics and innovation there. So. Uh, this company has, has started and has closed some financing as well. Uh, and in the bigger, bigger picture of things, if you were to look at Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, NVIDIA, and Google, conservatively about $50 billion um, of investment in artificial intelligence. So um, one thing that comes up, I think, is how do you manage all this information? How do you... Um, get it, store it, retrieve it, archive it, pull it out when you need it, and so forth and so on. So a few estimates here. Cisco estimates 167 terabytes per second of information move on the internet. Um, now FedEx has 654 airplanes with a capacity of 26.5 million pounds. So if you do the math, the internet wouldn't get to the capacity that FedEx has today until about 2040. And presumably, um, the planes will be get lighter weight, they'll hold more, they'll be more fuel efficient, the hard drives will be smaller, they'll hold more information. So it kind of speaks back to that um, idea. And then if you involve boats and trains and other forms of transportation, uh, we may not ever be able to do this faster electronically than we could with um, tractor trailers or station wagons hurtling down the road. What's weird about Andrew Tannenbaum's quote is about the year that he said that was about the year that they stopped producing station wagons, so um, in the early 80s. But um, he also said the, ni ni the nice thing about standards 
is that you have so many to choose from. I like to use that one. And that's a 1985 Chevy Caprice. I probably sat in the back of one of those things to hockey practice, but um, they, they, they are produced no more. So in terms of AI-enhanced healthcare, um, physicians will practice, the idea is that phys physicians will practice with AI virtual assistants, clinicians, and perhaps see five to 10 times as many patients. So improved efficiency, presumably without giving up any quality. Um, and this will both be for prevention as well as treatment. Um, you know, we're starting to see more wearables and micro technologies as well for diagnosis and treatment perhaps some in-home AI for independent living, and presumably the thoughts are that this might provide some cost savings. Um, in terms of pathology, um, I think it's pretty clear that new algorithms, are, we're gonna start to see more and more new algorithms in the next few years that will um, um, allow pathologists to incorporate those in their workflows you know, assuming the biomarkers maintain their specificity and that, and that sort of thing. Um, clearly, I think the algorithms will be used in conjunction with the pathologists, not in lieu of them. We had a discussion about this last night. I, I'm sure that feeling is not universal. But I think ultimately we'll ask ourselves, how did we ever live without this? But right now it appears to be disruptive, but I don't think, you know, any of us should be that concerned about it if you read slides for a living. Um, all of the other jobs that none of us like to do, medical directors and section chiefs, and not like to do, but have to do teaching, um, that'll still be, I think, a very human function. Um, there's a little bit of a paradox, too. People say, well, you know, with automation comes productivity, and I won't read this slide out loud, but the idea is that with automation uh, becomes productivity, with improved um, communication enhances productivity. And when you kind of crunch the numbers, and these were, this is data from the National Bureau of Economic Research, that actually isn't always the case. And it, what happens is new technologies fall into four major categories where things kind of fall apart. Um, there's false hopes, there's mismeasurements, there's concentrated distribution of the application, and then there's implementation and technology lags. And probably actually a fifth one is probably all the stuff that, that happens 10 years after all of that in terms of regulatory issues and licensing issues and, um, and, and all of that in terms of using it in practice in medicine. So, you know, if you look at 2018, you know, by 2020, we were supposed to have flying cars and supersonic air travel. You know, we were all supposed to be the Jetsons by now. Um, but instead, we got Twitter. Um, although I don't think it's 140 characters anymore, so that's good for the president. But, um, you know, nobody, I don't think anybody in this room can tell me that email has made them more productive. Email is a huge time drain. And, it, and email has made them more productive. Has it made it easier to communicate and share and collaborate? Sure. Has it made you more productive? I don't know. So Eric Topol at the Scripps Institute wrote this paper about uh, two years ago now, um, talking to... Um, I mean, I took it to mean t talking to radiologists and pathologists as information specialists and adopting to um, artificial intelligence. Um, and it really more focuses on radiology than pathology, but I think as was just mentioned in the last talk, as image intense specialists, diagnostic specialists, I think uh, you can draw the same conclusions. Um, and that is that the history of automation and the broader economy has a reassuring message. And I think this has been proven time and time again with automation, that jobs are not lost, rather roles are redefined. And humans are displaced to tasks needing a human element. Um, and so uh, to get back to where I started, uh, this is the last specimen I received uh, before I was supposed to get on an airplane to come here. The uh, 330 frozen, that wasn't on the schedule. And then when I did see it on the schedule, you know, 29 year old female with right at nexal mass. Okay, and then I walk into the frozen section room and this thing is sitting on a surgical cart. Um, it's 35 centimeters, it weighs 25 pounds, and you know, you have to deal with that. So um, um, one of my colleagues just called me and I said, you know, what did, that, what did that ovarian tumor turn out to be? He said, well, you know, there's some people who think it's a mucinous cyst adenoma, which is on the benign side. Some people think it's a mucinous uh, borderline tumor, low malignant potential tumor, which is in the middle. 
and some people think it's a mucinous cyst adenocarcinoma. Um, you know, there's that old saying, if you ask three pathologists for their opinion, you'll get four answers. So that's kind of where we are. It's like the, it's like the, uh, the surgeon who went to his hospital CEO and he said, um, I'd like a one-armed pathologist. And he said, why do you want a one-armed pathologist? And he said, well, because the pathologist comes to tumor board and he says, on one hand, it could be this, and on the other hand, it could be this. So um, I will close on the fact that medicine is a science of uncertainty and an art of probability, and I'm not sure that all the AI in the world is, uh, is going to change that. Thank you.